I am truly excited to see this turnout to, to come see um, Ron Pattinson. So, of course, with such a turnout, I'm going to hold you captive and tell you just a little bit about the fermentation science program that we've just started up here at Eastern to do a little commercial for that. Um, this is the first of a series of events over this year and upcoming years that we really want to help develop, strengthen the bonds between Eastern and the local fermentation community, brewing and broader. Um, so our, our next event is going to be June 14th. Um, Patrick McGovern is going to be um, giving a talk. There are a couple of signs up front. Patrick McGovern is a molecular archaeologist, but he is the, uh, the scientist that's involved with uh, dogfish heads, ancient ale spears. And so he'll be coming in to give a couple of talks in June. And we're, we're hoping to set up a dinner. That's not finalized, but, you know, we'll see. Um, so there'll be more. If you gave your email, you'll get an email about that. If you follow us on Facebook, keep an eye on that. You'll see more details as that, uh, as that gets finalized. Um, so we've got a lot of exciting things going on with the program. Um, for those of you that don't know, Eastern now has a four-year degree in fermentation science. We started that in 2016. Uh, you can now get a major or a minor in fermentation science. We welcome all of you who have finished with school to come back and get another degree. Um, we promise it's worth your time. Um, so with that academic side of the program, we've got a lot of exciting things going on. Um, collaborations like the one with the brinery where we've made this hot sauce. Um, we are working towards opening an educational brewery with Northern United in Midtown Detroit. Um, that's something we're in the middle of firming up right now. We, we hope that in early 2019 that will be a go. Um, you'll see more news about that. Um, they're in construction right now. We'll be providing the curriculum for that. Um, our first student graduated with a minor last weekend. Um, she's, she's been hired by Unity Vibration. We are, we are very proud of our students. We've got other students working out building a lab at the primary. Mel is here today. I so, said, hey, Mel. <laughs> um, so we, we hope to have some, some good news soon with some federal funding to help us build out the program. Um, we are renovating our own dedicated fermentation space and labs in the next year as well. So, so hopefully you guys will be seeing big things from Easter in the, in the realm of fermentation. Uh, we are open to working with any and all of you as time and energy permits as well. So if you think you've got cool ideas of how you can work with Eastern, hit, hit me with an email, come talk to me, and, and Ra's happy to chat too. So, but we are only one leg of the chair that is supporting this event today. Um, we've got some other great sponsors and supporters. Um, Brewing Consulting, one Taylor Watson Albrand over here, is an EMU biochemistry alum as well. It's a generous supporter of this event. The Ann Arbor Brewers Guild. And, uh, it's only about half of the crowd. <laughs> and then, but the, the person who made this event come off is Matt Becker. It wouldn't have happened without Matt. This is, the, the idea for this talk is Matt's, and when he was looking for a place to hold it, I tried to get my hand up first. <laughs> so, so here we are. Um, Matt, do you want to come on up and say a few words? <coughs> Thanks for coming, everybody. I do appreciate it today. I'm, I'm glad to see the big turnout. It uh, definitely makes the event worth having. Um, just out of curiosity, how many of you here today are familiar with Ron Pattinson's work before this uh, talk? All right, so, and so you've been on his, his blog, Shut Up About Barclay Perkins, which I've always assumed was thanks to his wife. I'm sick of him talking about Barclay Perkins. And Ron, you should shut up about Barclay Perkins. So uh, I'm assuming that would be true. 
So um, as most of you know, Ron is probably the, one of the foremost historians in the world right now researching beer. He's one of the few people who've actually decided to go out and dig up old logs and, and compile the data and actually see if all these stories we've been telling people all this time are true or if it's just a bunch of bollocks. So apparently <laughs> most of it was wrong. So um, I don't know about other brewers in the audience here, but I have certainly changed the way I make a lot of my beers because of Ron's research, and uh, I hope everyone else can learn from it as well and, and expand on the research he does. Um, Ron's probably an author of at least 30 books, maybe more, more maybe 40 or 50. Um, he's also an accomplished travel writer too, so I recommend everybody check out his travel writings as well. Um, and beyond that, I would also recommend uh, you know check out all the local breweries. You know, there's plenty of them around, so drink local. So, Ron, if you want to come on up and, and get all this started, appreciate it. And again, thanks for traveling all this way from the Netherlands to uh, talk to us. Well, good evening, everyone. I hope I'm not going to detain you for too long this evening. If you start getting thirsty through this talk, feel free to go up discreetly and get a beer. I'm certainly going to be drinking while I'm doing this, because otherwise my throat's going to get really dry. The best way of keeping yourself, your throat lubricated out always found with some beer. So what we're going to be talking about today, or I'm going to be talking about, you're going to be having to listen to, is... What's this book? This isn't working. Um, <coughs> There we go. Got it. It's working the wrong way around. Right? Um, <laughs> America, we drive on the other side of the road. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm holding the wrong way off. <laughs> Not to worry. I'm sure I'm working out. I'm supposed to be a computer professional, so I should be able to do things like this. Um, the 18th century was a key point in English brewing. It's really where the modern brewing began. When you see industrialization start to take place, where beer becomes way more consistent than it had been before, and where you have all these really key pieces of technology that help the beer to become consistent. And it's also the origin of most of the styles that we see today. One of the big problems when you start looking at 18th century brewing is terminology. And if you don't understand what the terms mean meant, you can make absolutely no sense of anything written in the 18th century. And there's lots of examples I, I can name of where people have looked at the old text and have assumed that words meant the same as they mean today and have come incredibly unstuck. The most important thing to realize is the terms beer and ale meant something very specific in the 19th century. They were not synonyms. <coughs> and when they wanted to use a general term, they would call malt liquor, which may sound old to Americans, where you think that malt liquor is a very specific sort of not very nice beer. But if you look <laughs> at old American legislation, or even modern American legislation, it still uses sometimes the term malt liquor in the same way as it's used in 18th century England. So meaning all types of fermented malt beverages. Um, and you can see this quote here about uh, how they first started to use hops in the 1400s and 1500s. Before that, the original, sort of, the original type of malt liquor that was produced in, in England was called ale. It was unhopped, and it was only when you had famished weavers coming over to, to live in London during the late 15th century that they started to use hops. And that's when you get this new type of drink which is called beer. And it gradually changed over the years, so in the 17th century that they started adding hops to ale as well, but in way smaller quantities than to beer. And so there was still a big distinction between the two types. Um, you may have heard the story about Henry VIII forbidding these brewers to use hops it's actually a complete load of rubbish. What he did was, he forbade his ale brewer to use hops. He also had a beer brewer who did use hops. And he, he, the only thing he objected to was people using hops in ale. Not in any malt liquor, only in ale. 
I got really annoyed when I was at uh, Wicked Weed in Asheville, and they got this big thing of Henry VIII up, and it's all based around him calling hops an uh, evil and pernicious weed, and whereas in fact there's not any, ev any evidence he ever said that. But it makes a nice story for people. So the, the divisions you had between malt liquors were, you had beer and ale on the one hand, so heavily hopped, lightly hopped, and you also had young and old. Um, mild, people get very confused about mild ale. People think, oh, it means something that's not very strong, or something that's not very heavily hot. Well, in the past, both of things, those things have not been true. If you look at early 19th century mild ale, it's heavily hopped compared to most modern beers, and also quite strong. One of the favourite beers I ever got anyone to make was an 1832 4X Mild Ale from London, which was 10.5% alcohol and about 90 IBUs. <laughs> it was still a Mild Ale because it was sold young, because it wasn't aged. Um, one of the old terms that they use in the 18th century is, they use the term stale for aged beer. Now, to modern ears, stale means something that's old and has gone off old and bad, but there was nothing negative about the way stale was used in the 18th century. People would happily buy something that was called stale beer. They wouldn't think, oh god, I'm not going to drink that. They'd, be, they'd actually pay more money for it. Um, start is a, is a brilliant one because the misunderstanding of the term start has been responsible for one of the most long-lasting and annoying stories, which is that Porto was a development of three threads. And that's purely based on the fact that someone in the 19th century misunderstood what the term start meant. And so, there's one, one passage in this, this uh, letter by someone called Obadiah Poundage, that, that wasn't his real name, but it would be great if that was his real name. It so, sounds like someone out of Dickens. Uh, and he wrote that he was someone in the brewing trade. He wrote this long letter explaining about the history of porter. And one of the things he said was that at a certain point, publicans were having to start three butts. And this comes just after he's described this mixture of beer called three threats. And so someone who didn't understand what the term start meant assumed that meant tapping three different barrels of beer. Whereas, in fact, what start means in a brewing sense, and you see it even in some 20th century British brewing records, it means laying down to mature. It doesn't mean tapping, it means something completely different. In the same way, fine means to clear. Uh, so you see often in, uh, I used to misinterpret this, you'll see these mirrors in British pubs where it'll say, Joe Bloggs, fine ales. And I used to think that meant, oh, they're saying that their ales are really good. What it really meant was that their ales were clear. It had nothing to do with the quality of them, fine just meaning clear, as in finings. And, uh, it's that same connection. Finings are just something that you use to find beer, something to make it clear. And the term work is used for fermenting. Don't know why, but these are just words where the chain, where the, either they got a very specific brewing meaning or the meaning of the, has changed over the years. Actually, this is a... That passage there, that's from Obadiah Poundage. And you can see the bit where it says, and the brewer, well, it looks like it says, farted, but it's actually the funny way they used to write the essence. Um, it does sound really, look really strange. Farting, three, four, or... <laughs> a fifth of at a time, but <laughs> it's, uh, it's always great if you run this stuff as one of these 18th century texts through, a, through an OCR program. <laughs> <laughs> they come up with some very strange results sometimes. <laughs> there were three base malts, and in the 18th century, all they had were base malts. So you had pale, amber, and brown and they didn't use any other malts, and people just brewed beers from a single malt. So a brown ale was, a, was a, an ale brewed from 100% brown malt. A pale ale was a beer brewed from 100% pale malt. 
and there were no specialty mods, everything was just base mods. And they all, all, pretty much always only ever used one base mod in any beer, or any mod liquor, I should say. So I'm falling into the trap of using modern terms. Malt was made in a variety of ways. I've, I've had lots of arguments on the internet with people. This used to be one of my hobbies, arguing with people on the internet, but I don't have <laughs> time for it anymore. Um, about how smoky brown malt or malt in general would have been. And it's interesting when you look at the old texts that they specifically say that the malt made in some parts of Britain where they used certain types of wood produced these beers that most people thought were undrinkable because they were too smoky. And the malt that they used in London normally came from Hertfordshire, which is a rural area maybe 15, 20 miles north of London. And there they used straw for, dry, for kilning their malt. And that was the way of kilning that produced the least smoky flavour. And this seems to be that they virtually always use the malt from there. You can see it on the brewing records, even in the early 19th century, where it will say HB, HP, and the HB, that stands for Hart Hertfordshire Brown, HP, Hertfordshire Pale. And there was a huge degree of variation in which, which fuels they used. And the worst was the southwest, where they used wool, would, and in general, people hated the beers from the southwest, and the only people who could drink them were the people who had grown up with them and got used to them, which is sort of like anything. There's loads of really weird, strong regional flavours that you can only stomach if you've grown up with it. So, I'm just trying to think of an example. Like mushy peas, that would be something. <laughs> so, something that most people find a bit odd. Uh, but what you find, like, starting from around 1600, is they start to use coke, and that's when you start having reliably produced pale malt, because they could control the temperature much better, and so you could kill something quite pale and quite consistently. And so you see all through the 18th century, pale malt is becoming more common, and you're having more pale ales and pale beers brewed, just because the malt's becoming more available. <coughs> So, and pale malt, that's really important for what happens later on in the 18th century, when you have one of the biggest events that, in, in terms of the history of British beer, which is uh, the Napoleonic Wars, which completely transformed the way people brewed, and in particular transformed the way people brewed porter. Um, we'll get, get to it later, but it's a juxtaposition of various things, so of technology, of increased taxation because of the war, and that's what brought about the modern way of brewing, of using a pale malt base and just with speciality malts if you wanted to be a coloured. And then that's when you see all the other base malts fall out of use. Brown malt was the cheapest malt. That's why porter was brewed from brown malt. It was the cheapest malt because porter was a mass produced beer and it, it wasn't meant to be expensive, so people wanted the cheapest malt to use. Um, this was brown malt, which at the time was diastatic. Um, it was killed uh, at a higher temperature and turned it quite a dark colour uh, and often quite an inconsistent colour. And what also happened often was it had popped like popcorn. And this was something that the maltsters would like because of the way that malt was sold. And malt was sold generally in quarters and in bushels. And those are volume measurements. So, if you've got something that's popped, like popcorn, it's a bigger volume, but it's a lower weight. And eventually, brewers tweaked to this, but, it, but only really when there were technological advances. Um, London brown malt, as I said, was normally killed with straw. They did use some of the some of the fuels sometimes, but mostly it was straw. And another one of the things to say why there wouldn't have been much smoky taste probably in Porter is you read the old accounts and they say, well, if you do have malt that's very smoky, what you need to do is you need to heavily hop the beer and you need to leave it to mature and then the smoky taste is going to 
fade and mellow, and the beer's going to be more drinkable and more accessible. Amber malt was sort of like in between pale and brown malt. It was used quite extensively as a base malt in the 18th century. And so you had amber ales, amber beers, and it was sort of like a halfway house between the two. What really transformed <coughs> brewers' ideas about malt is when they started using the hydrometer. And so you see the first experiments with the hydrometer are in the 1770s. Hydrometers had actually been around since the 17th century, but they'd only been used in distilling. They hadn't been used in brewing. And when you had the malt tax going up to pay for the wars against the French, brewers became aware of what yield they were getting from the different malts. And they found out that even though pale malt cost more, it was cheaper to use because they got a better yield from it. And that's when you see they start changing their porting risks. And they start going, at first they go over to using 30 or 40% pale malt. And eventually, by the time you get to, up to the end of the 18th century, they've gone up to 70% pale malt. And it transforms the way everything is brewed. So basically, no one uses any other malt apart from pale malt as a base malt. Brown ale completely disappears, no one makes it anymore, and all the beers are pale. So in 1800, the only dark beers that you had in, in Britain were Porter and Stout. Everything else was pale. And these are some ideas of, of uh, molten hot prices. Um, so you can see the difference in price, how much malt went up per quarter. So a quarter is approximately 336 pounds. Uh, and you can see the way the price of hops was going up. And so this put a, a tremendous pressure on brewers to try and brew more efficiently because there was a lot of resistance among drinkers to pay any more money for their beer. There's a great story I was telling earlier on uh, uh, from the 1850s during another war, this time with the, when the French were actually on our side for a change, the Crimean War. And there's a publican talking to a parliamentary committee about what he did with his beer. And they're saying to him, well, do you, do you adulterate your beer? And he said, look, I'm paying, the, the customers won't pay more than tuppence a pint for it, and that's what it cost me to buy from the brewery. What the hell do you expect me to do? And he said, look, look I'm quite good. All I do, I only put water in. I'm not like some of the other crooks who put all sorts of other rubbish in. I mean, maybe he's being a bit disingenuous there, but... But it just shows that at certain points people had to adulterate the beer just to be able to make any profit on it. And this is all because the consumers in Britain were incredibly reluctant to ever pay more money for their beer. <coughs> Even in the 18th century, hop growing was concentrated in just a few parts of the UK. So basically the same ones there are today. So the south east of England, mostly Kent, but a little bit in the neighbouring counties, and in the Midlands, in Herefordshire and Worcestershire. The Kent hops were normally considered the best. Uh, well, Kent and Farnham hops. Farnham is in Surrey. Well, most of it's in Surrey. Um, they were the hops that people would pay the most for, even at this age. And these are going to be hops that were similar to Golding's. I mean, Golding's goes back to the 18th century, but you have a whole bunch of related varieties called white mites that are very similar to Golding's. And in fact, most of what's sold as EKG today isn't actually Golding's hops. It's a whole load of related white mite varieties. And EKG is basically just a marketing term. It's not actually telling you what the hops are genetically. I was amazed when I found that out. When I was writing my home brewer's guide to vintage <coughs> beer, I actually had to ask someone about the hops because because I've been so nasty to people who've got things wrong about brewing history before. <laughs> I could imagine what had happened if I got something wrong. So uh, I, I spoke to someone who really knew about hops and got him to proofread what I'd written. Um, I was really surprised at a lot of the things he told me. I'm glad I asked him because otherwise I'd have got some stuff horribly wrong. Um, it was quite, quite often to re well, quite common to reuse hops. Uh, and in fact, that, that didn't even stop in the 18th century. 
Um, one of the beers they put on at the back, the William Younger S1 Stout, I'm pretty sure that that had spent hops in it. Am I right there? Yeah. So, th this is always a nightmare for me if I'm writing a recipe. How do you account for the fact that half the hops have already been used in another brew? <laughs> what, what level of bitterness is there left in them? And it's like, uh, 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 I'll just have a guess. <laughs> so I normally knock it down to about 25% of the weight, but I've no idea if that's right. I could say to people, well, if you're going to be truly authentic, use the hops and then reuse them, but I'm not sure anyone would really want to do that, especially not in a professional brewery. Um, even in the 18th century, they were well aware of the differences in brewing waters. And they knew that certain types of waters and waters in certain places were much better for brewing than other ones. <coughs> and so you see some of the similar recommendations to do today that for darker beers you want softer water, for paler beers you want hard water. And what you have in London is sort of semi-hard waters, which it turns out are quite good for brewing the, the pale and brown, the, the brown, brown beers and brown ales that were the backbone of London brewing. Um, whether or not this was completely determined by the water, I don't know, I'm a bit reluctant to go down that road, but it's certainly true that the London water was quite well suited to the types of beers they ended up brewing in London. Um, there was no concept of water treatment that's much later, that's not until the, I think about the 1860s, 1870s that they start knowing enough about water chemistry to start treating it. And, then, and that's mostly because of the fashion for pale ales and people wanted to get bourbon type water because they knew that they couldn't get the beers to taste like Burton pale ales unless they had the right type of water. And so you see the, initially the weird thing that London breweries sell separate breweries in Burton just for brewing pale ales. So Truman's, one of the large London porter breweries, they didn't brew any pale ales in the 19th century in their London brewery. All they brewed there was mild porter and stout. Their pale ales were all brewed in a separate brewery 100, 150 miles away in Burton. I've often heard people say about brewing, no one could brew all year round until there was artificial refrigeration. That's definitely not true. And this is due to another another technological advance that we're going to see in a minute. In fact, a technological advance, I was, I was most impressed when I was going around a brewery today and actually saw some of these things, because I didn't think anyone in the US had them anymore, but that, it was quite interesting to see. But they sussed out that, it, just like in, in, in Germany, where you had a, a brewing season that was basically from uh, the beginning of, of autumn till the end of spring, that was how they brewed in a lot of the UK, but London brewers ignored that. Even before you had the technological advances, they just brewed all the year round. And these are the things that really put brewing on a much more technological basis. So you've got the thermometer, again, which has been around since the 17th century, modern types of thermometers, but hadn't been used in brewing until the 1760s. Then you've got the hydrometer, so I think everyone, I think everyone knows what the hydrometer is. Yeah. And then you've got the attemperator. This is the thing I saw today. Uh, hands up, hands up who knows what the attemperator is. Okay. So it is worth my while explaining it. Uh, attemperator, basically it's just a series of metal pipes inside the fermenter. And all you do is you just put cold brine to it, and it means you can control the temperature of the fermentation pretty much precisely. So if you've got a thermometer and a temperators, you've taken all the guesswork out of fermentation. You can control the temperature, you can cool it down when you want to, you can make sure that you, all your fermentations are at exactly the same temperature. And that is, is the, and these three, three pieces of technology combined completely transform brewing. And then on top of that what you get are things like steam power. And so some of the first steam engines to be installed in London in the late 18th century 
were installed in the big breweries. And they're starting to do away with manual labor. So they're starting to mechanize their mash tons. They're starting to mechanize how they're lifting the malt from the, the malt up to their malt store so they can reduce the amount of labor, so they can produce beer more efficiently and more cheaply. And this gives the big breweries in London a huge advantage. And you can see they really press that home. And so, whereas in most of the UK, you've still got loads of pub breweries right up until World War I, literally thousands of them. By 1800, there's only a handful of pub breweries left in London. They've virtually been exterminated because they can't compete with the large industrial breweries. Um, in the 18th century, there was no starching in, in England. And the, the standard method, if you, if you see the way they, they, uh, they mashed porter, it was generally three, four or five separate mashes, all at different temperatures. I've never been able to work out why they do it. They're sort of up and down, so you'll start off with what looks like a fairly normal mashing temperature. Then you might have one that looks very hot, then one that looks very cold. Um, so it's quite strange, but I know from pe speaking from pe to people who've done some of these complicated mashing schemes that they get incredible efficiency out of it. And this is obviously what the London brewers are after. What they'd also do is, even after, even, even after they got the, the last wall that was really usable, so something like about 1,008 OG, they'd have stuff that was like really at the end, maybe 1,005, and they'd use that as brewing water, so they managed to extract even that last tiny little bit of extract from the malt. Again, because they were brewing on a really large scale, it was worth their while to do this. Um, another one of the topics where I've had some of my most interesting arguments is about party guiding. And most people tend to think party guiling is what it was like in the 18th century. So in the 18th century, if you'd had four mashes, often you would use all four mashes for different beers. Um, so you'd have a strong elf or, or beer from the first mash, a, a standard strength one from the second mash, and then the third and fourth you'd use to make a small beer or a table beer. One of the innovations of the 18th century was to start brewing beer called entire guile which is where you blend all the warts together. So you make a single beer or ale from one brew. And Porter was an early example of a beer that was usually brewed in tire guile. And this is probably where the word entire comes from, even though there's been lots of argument about that as well. Especially recently. <coughs> okay. Just excuse me a second. Um, someone's come up with a theory recently that Entire means something completely differently, that it means you have, you've only used bolts and not used molasses, but personally I think that's bollocks, because it's well documented as a brewing term, entire, so I don't see why you should suddenly think up some other explanation, but people like doing that. And of course, modern party guiling, as performed by Fullers, is something completely different. In modern party guiling, you don't use uh, a single wort for one beer, you blend all the warts together to make different strengths beers. So if you see the way Fullers do it, where you've got Golden Pride, London Pride, e e ESB, and Chiswick, all brewed from the same basic brew, all of them have got some of each uh, wort in them. So they have two warts, and they deliberately make the strongest wort a bit stronger than they want Golden Pride to be, and then they water that down with a bit of the weaker wort, and then the other ones, they just balance them up together. And so you'll see that we're all these beers in various combinations, so you'll have Chiswick and ESP brewed together, Golden Pride, London Pride, and ESP may be brewed together, they can brew in any combination they want. And it's a very efficient way of brewing, because it means you can brew small batch beers on a large brewing equipment. So Fuller's used to make this beer in the, in, in the 1930s called uh, Old Burton Extra, where <clears throat> the largest batch that I've ever seen was 10 barrels, and their brewing brew length is 300. But because they were party dialing it with other beers, they could still make it and make it efficiently. 
Um, usually, when they were mashing in London, they heat up the water by direct fire and then mix it all up by hand. Um, I've done this at a brewery, mixing up by hand, and I can tell you it got pretty old after about a minute, and <laughs> I definitely wouldn't want to do it for 30 minutes, and which is what people would have to do in the old days, and this was just a tiny little mash tun as well. It can't be any fun for the people who were doing that. Um, and you see that when they're talking, when they're in the pre thermometer days, they're talking about blood heat and stuff like this, and they're sticking their hand or their elbow into it. It's all a bit, um, yeah, it's not exactly hugely accurate. And I mean, I always think that one of the reasons they they uh, decocted on the continent was because when you boil up some of the mash, then you know exactly what temperature it is. And so then you can control the temperatures quite accurately without having a thermometer. Uh, but in, in the UK, to say adopted th thermometers quite early, you didn't have to mess around with any of that rubbish. Um, <coughs> So here again, they're almost boiling the water, then mixing it in, and then messing around. It's it's all very complicated. I'm not going to go through it read. You, you you can read, so I'm not going to explain this. But it, it's it's very complicated the way that we're doing it. And and you can see at the end the, th the three matches all at different temperatures, all up and down in the temperature scale. Porter they usually brewed in Taiwan. And they did some, and it was the same thing. They had different temperature matches, usually swapping between warm and cold. And there was no sparging. Sparging, you only see sparging appear in England in about the 1850s. Originally, it was a Scottish technique, um, probably because the Scottish are mean and they don't want to keep doing multiple matches, and it's cheaper if you just do a single infusion and a sparge. Um, so, and that. It, the Scottish techniques eventually spread over to Britain, to the rest of Britain, just because it's a simpler way of working. But even in the late 19th century, some of the London brewers were still doing two mashes. Two mashes, two underlets, and sparging. So still quite complicated mashing schemes. Whereas in Scotland, even in the 1830s, it was a single infusion, one or two sparges. And this is an example of a, of a brewing record um, from my favourite, Barclay Perkins. I always really like these uh, brewing records. You see, they, they had such wonderful handwriting. It's, uh, it always amazes me that people went to so much trouble for something that was just a production record that no one had seen except people working in the brewery. So they obviously took a, a fair amount of pride in it. And um, just to tell you what this beer is, this is EI. It took me ages to work out what this stood for, EI. It used to really confuse me. It means Export India. So this is, a, this is the porter equivalent of an IPA. So it's a beer intended for the Indian market. And the reason it says Whitbreads there is because they've used Whitbread yeast. This is the mashing scheme. So you can see they yeah. So you can see four mashes. This is the amount of water, and this is the tap, this is the strike heat, this is the tap heat. And so you can see it's hot, cold, hot, cold. Alright, oh, I've done this nicely. So you can see exactly what it was. I mean, the, the Barclay Perkins records are wonderfully detailed, and I really like them. And here you can see the malt. And so what we've been saying about SP, that means Sussex Pale, HP, Hearts Brown, NHP, New Hearts Brown. And then this is the, the blending. So you can see they've got the three warts that combine together to 19.6 pounds per barrel or just over 10.55. Usually they boiled the boils were relatively short, so 60 to 90 minutes. And 
quite often all the hops are added at the beginning of the boil. Sometimes they'd have two additions, sometimes they'd have three additions, it'd vary. But quite often it would be all at the start of the boil. Um, some of the people say, well, you shouldn't boil the hops for more than 30 minutes. And so what they do is they put the hops in, the, in, in bags so they can take them out after 30 minutes and then put in another bag with hops, put that in for 30 minutes and then take that out. Um, so quite complicated. Open cooler, what most people nowadays call a cool ship. I used to get very upset about people calling it a cool ship. Say, well, that's not actually the English word, but I got put in my place when I was talking to Derek Prentice, who's was head brewer at Fuller's and at Young's, and he said, oh, we used to have a cool ship at, at Truman. And so I realised that the term was actually used in the, in, in the UK. But it's just purely something to, a, a way of cooling the wort. It's nothing to do with infecting it or brewing sour beers, it's just how you used to have to pull wort out. So you have something, a very wide, shallow vessel. Because it's shallow, all the metal will knock in the wart settles out much more easily. So you've got the advantage of helping to make the wart clearer as well as cooling it down. Um, fermentation temperatures, from what I know from the 19th century, porter they often let ferment at really high temperatures. So when you see the fermentation records, you'll see they might be pitching it as, as high as 65, 68 degrees, and then letting it run up to 80, sometimes as much as 85. And I think the reason they were doing that is they were just trying to ferment it really quickly because it was a mass-produced beer, they wanted to get it through the brewery as quickly as possible, and it doesn't seem to have affected the flavour of the beer, but I mean, I look at some of the fermentation temperatures, and it's not as hot as I'd want to ferment anything. Um, most of the beers, they didn't let them get quite as hot. Um, but some of the beers, especially the cheaper ones, they prevent really warm even though they knew that if they fermented it cooler, it had better keeping quantities. Um, in the north, aerating the warts, that's, that's something that's also true today. Uh, because the, the Yorkshire Square system, that's something where you're constantly aerating the wart because you're pumping it up into an upper vessel and then letting it fall down again. So, okay, it's partly to get rid of the yeast, but it's also helping to put lots of oxygen into the, into the wart. Um, the way they, they date uh, harvest yeast is pretty much the same way you do it today. Just skim it off the top and put it in a vessel. Um, but normally beers were sold and drunk pretty quickly. The big innovation of Porter was that rather than just shipping the beer out as soon as it, let, as soon as it had finished primary fermentation, which is what they did up until about the 1730s, 1740s. Porter breweries started to age it in the brewery themselves. And what they noticed was that the larger the vessel they, ferment, they aged it in, the better it aged, the more consistent it was, and so they started this crazy thing of building these ridiculously large vats. Um, you'll notice in mostly when you see these things, oh, but they normally put a figure in so you can see just how huge these things were. I mean, they're ridiculous. They, they told dinner parties inside these vats. I mean, really, you know, so 20 or 30 people having a meal inside a vat. I don't know how they got in and out. But. The way that they matured porter is something else that gave a huge advantage to the large industrial breweries because they could afford to build these huge vats that most other people couldn't. So the smaller breweries, they couldn't afford to have a vat that held 20,000 barrels because they wouldn't produce 20,000 barrels of beer in a year. And so it's another way that the big breweries really cornered the market in porter. And they went really crazy about it. It was sort of like, I've got a bigger one than you have, sort of thing. So they all tried to build the biggest vats possible, possible, which occasionally ended in disaster, like when they had the beer flood in 1816. 
think killed about a dozen people. There's, there's this huge vat that broke at the Mukes Brewery, which was just, um, just off Oxford Street, right in the centre of London. And the flood was so big, it demolished, I think, three or four houses, drowned all the people who were in the cellars of it. I mean, really quite horrible. Um, this is to give you uh, some idea of how big the breweries were. So these are all in imperial barrels. So, and these are 36 gallon barrels. So you can see even at the, end, at the end of the 18th century, there were several breweries producing more than 100,000 barrels. To put this into context, the largest brewery on continental Europe at the time probably didn't produce 20,000 barrels. Um, and there's a reason why the London breweries were bigger than anywhere else. It was just because you couldn't move beer around very quickly at that time. And London was the only place with a lot, big enough population of beer drinkers to support large breweries. In the 19th, 18th century, London already had a population of a million, most of whom drank beer. And so there was a huge market for beer, and you could afford to brew it on a very large scale. Um, porter brewers, when they first started aging, they normally aged for six months. And, they, and they'd age all the porter for six months, and then they gradually started changing to aging some of it for a longer time and blending it with young beer. Whereas domestic brewers, and in the 18th century, a large percentage of beer, probably 50% 50, 50 was brewed what, what, I, what was described as domestically. So that means that's a combination of things. That could be a country house with its own brewery. It could just be an agricultural labourer brewing beer for his own family. It could also be uh, a church, a hospital. Lots of hospitals have their own breweries. Um, also, all, most of the uh, colleges at Oxford and Cambridge had their own breweries. And so these were all what's called domestic breweries because it wasn't beer that was for sale. It was only for people for the, for the use of the people who were brewing it. Um, yeah, they sometimes added some weird stuff to the vats. I'm not sure how, how effective that was in really helping it. But they, they seem to have this thing about putting flour and brandy and stuff in. And I don't know, I don't mind, I don't, I don't mind them putting brandy in. I wouldn't object to having some brandy in my water, but I'm not so sure about the flour. Um, I was really surprised when I found out how early findings were used. So I think the earliest reference I've seen to Eisenglass is about 1600. Um, by 1700 it seems to have been common, mostly because it helped people to get a beer into a nice, a nice clear condition quicker. You do see them say though, if you're brewing a, 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 a keeping beer, that it should actually drop right of its own accord. So drop right spontaneously if you leave it long enough. But people would want to get a beer that they could sell more quickly, and so they do it artificially with findings. Uh, it's all sort of gone a bit full circle now. Now you've got loads of people doing cask beer in Britain that they call unfined. And people seem to think this has to mean that it's, that it's not clear, which is rubbish really. Just because you haven't find it doesn't mean it should be cloudy, but people seem to think unfined means cloudy nowadays. Just shows what stupid ideas people can get. <laughs> um, often you'll hear people say, oh well, everything used to be sour and people didn't know how to clean anything properly. It's not true, they were perfectly well aware that if you didn't keep stuff clean that your beer was going to get infected. And they were using boiling water, quick lime, they were trying quite hard, even though obviously they, a lot, most of the things that were used to be brewed were wooden, so there's way more chance of getting infection in it. But they were trying pretty hard to keep everything clean, because they didn't want to have lots of sour beer that wouldn't be saleable. Now we're getting into beer styles. The two main families, as we've already heard, beer and ale, and then they're divided up by the strength and by how old they were. So initially, 
The beer styles, it's all to do with the colour of the base plot, what strength it was, how long it was kept before it was sold. So, really quite simple. And then if you get beers, then you've got the, these are the malt liquors that were heavily hot. And so you've got various types of keeping beer, so that either March or October beer, and then you've got the wonderfully named Bud beer, which is porter and stout. <coughs> and then you've got the small beer, which is what they let the kids drink. So, must have been a lovely time to be a child. <laughs> Actually, this is what I'm drinking, a butter beer. So I thought, I thought it was the most appropriate thing to drink while I was doing this. Ales, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, so you've got it done by strength and by the colour of the base plot. Um, it's all pretty simple. And you don't really have any styles other than that. It's only when you start to have porter and stout develop as specific styles that you really have things that are named styles for the first time. So, initially porter was just brown beer, but eventually a specific type of brown beer came to be known as porter, and it came to be something quite distinct in its own right, and that's probably the first time that had happened in Britain. And here's a, an overview of, of styles. Um, the OGs in here, are, but these are the gravities are just my guess, basically, based on the quantity of, of mold that they say went into these beers, and making some assumptions about efficiency and stuff like that. Um, but we do know that the, the one at the bottom, the starting, oh, that's the wrong button, that's the, wrong the starting book beer, that's the original porter, that's what they called it, starting book beer. So, uh, a beer that was being laid down in butts to be matured. And you can see it's got a fairly decent gravity, 1075. Um, so you've got something that's getting on for 7% ABV. And you have to realize that at the time, if you go back and look at the strengths of wine, most wine wasn't stronger than about 7 or 8% ABV uh, until fairly recently. And even in the 19th century, most wines under 10% alcohol. And you see that English beer is pretty much the same strength as, as most continental wines, the stronger English beers, and the strongest ones stronger. And this is stuff that's actually the first real recorded strength. So this is from some of the earlier exper early experiments with the hydrometer. And what's interesting is to see how good the rate of attenuation was with porter, and that's probably because they were maturing it in vats, and because it was having a secondary fermentation with Britannomyces, so that was going to drive down the, the final gravity. So you've got something there that looks quite like a modern beer, so it's 75% attenuated, 6.5% um, alcohol from 1070. It's, it, it wouldn't look that unusual. If you see late 19th century lagers, the rate of attenuation is truly pathetic, and there's hardly any of them that get over 65%, and there's plenty of the stronger ones that are hardly over 50% attenuated. The, the early versions of Salvata, it's ridiculous. Some of them are even under 50% attenuated. These are the uh, hopping rates. So you can see that the, we can hear brown ale, that's really, really low, three quarters of a pound for a, for a strong beer, for a strong, for a strong malt liquor. And the original pale ales, so the 18th century sort of pale ale, which has absolutely no connection with modern pale ale, was also very lightly hot. Uh, whereas you see the, the beers, it's like a factor of three or four more in terms of how many hops they've got. So they're much, much more heavily hot. But you see, by the time you get through to the early 19th century, the distinction in terms of hopping has been very much eroded. So if you look at 
Lion Vale's pails from the 1830s, they're pretty heavily hopped. They've got, you know, maybe three, four pounds of hops per barrel. Uh, March and October beers, these were the strongest, most expensive. These were beers that were usually brewed domestically. Not many commercial brewers made beers like this because they were too expensive. Um, so, usually the, the commercial beers weren't quite as strong as that and they weren't aged for anything like as long. Pale beer, I was discussing earlier about pale stout, um, which people think is a, a, a slightly strange concept of pale stout. But if you're thinking in 18th century terms, there's nothing odd about it at all. Um, what we normally think of as stout was called brown stout. All it means is, stout means a strong beer, and then you've got pale or brown, saying which type of base malt you've used. So, some of the porter breweries, they brewed pale stout and they brewed brown stout. Uh, but pale stout seems to have died out around 1800. I mean, I've only found one brewing record of it from 1805, from my favorite, again, Barclay Perkins. You'll understand why my family keeps telling me to shut up about it. So I, I, I do keep returning to it quite often. Um, and so these were strong beers, very fairly simple, just smash beers, just all pound malt, and quite a lot of hops. Brown beer, that's, that's what Porter and Stout were. They were brown beers, and Porter is really just a specific type of brown beer that ended up getting the name and became incredibly popular and then people pretty much forgot about all the other brown beers. Um, and you see that the terminology changes over the years, so obviously stag brown butt beer is a bit of a mouthful. You wouldn't want to be ordering that after a few pints. So, especially not considering it was probably 7 or 8% alcohol, so, and they quite often drank in quarts in those days. So, there were a strong bunch, well, at least the ones who got through childhood. <laughs> <laughs> and so, here's some examples. So you can see the really strong beers. I mean, this is, even today, that's, that's a pretty high gravity. You're not really going to get, you can't really get that much higher in OG than that. And so, pretty much all the all the, all the what were considered full strength beers were quite strong and then you get small beer which is pretty weedy but then again that was something that was a water substitute you weren't supposed to be getting drunk on that that was just for building for hydration purposes so it's a bit like the way that in, in belgium up until quite recently they they'd have they'd, they'd, they'd similar types of things table beer in schools because they're only one and a half percent alcohol and there were some people in Belgium arguing, well, it's actually better if the kids drink that rather than they drink all these horrible fizzy drinks like cola, which is probably actually much worse for them because they're full of sugar and all sorts of other crap. And they'd probably really be better off just drinking weak beer. I think I'd go along with that, especially if I was a kid. <laughs> um, these are, the, uh, these are the earliest ones I've got from actual records. So this isn't quite the 18th century, but it's close enough. And so you can see that it's quite a decent range of beers that they've got. Uh, you can see the port has come down in gravity. It's only about 1052 now. This is a result of the Napoleonic Wars. The strengths go up again after you get past 1815, after the end of the, the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, there's a great note at, what, at the start of one of the Barclay Perkins Brewing Records, where there's this little note saying, 1815, end of the French Wars. So, they, they quite like throwing on little things in. I know, there's a great one in the, one of the Whitbread Brewing Logs from 1940, where it's just this little note saying, bomb dropped through the fermentation room last night. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, they're basically quite blasé about it. But, and I, I and you can see again, like, uh, I, I love things the way they call stuff family. So you get quite a lot of things called family ale and family beer in the 19th century. Uh, it might sound odd to us, but what that means is 
that's the sort of beer that you'd drink at home. So this is when people would buy in casks and have them in their house and drink them. And it's only later on that they start having bottled beer. Really, it's only after 1900 that you get bottled beer to any extent in the UK. So before that, if you wanted beer at home, either you'd have to go out to the pub with a jug and get that filled up, or you'd have a cask of your own at home. But people would prefer to have their own cask because they wouldn't trust what the publican was doing with their beer because, as I said earlier, there were periods where there was a lot of adulteration going on. So if you bought your own cask directly from the brewery, you knew exactly what you'd got. <coughs> and this is just showing you what's in the, in, the, in the beer. So you can see the percentage of brown malt is very high in some of these. Uh, but this is before the introduction of black malt. And so they were going to have quite high percentages of brown malt to get the colour. And this is the real problem that they have in the early 19th century. It's getting ported dark enough when they're not using 100% brown malt grist. And so one of the things you see happen is they change the way they make the brown malt. So they start killing it darker and it loses its diastatic power because they don't need the diastatic power anymore because they've got the pale malt, but they do need to get the colour from the brown malt, and so they make it darker. And then eventually, when you get the development of uh, black malt, then you see the brown malt percentage go down, but it still stayed 15 to 20% in most London porters and stacks right through the 19th century. Small beer or ale, these are the things from the later runnings. They weren't that, that strong, they're probably a bit watery because they were using the lower quality warts. Um, they pretty much died out. In, in London, I've only got a few from Bartley Perkins up until about the 1840s, and then they end. Um, the Bartley Perkins table is quite interesting. It's like a, a low gravity porter, so about 3.5% alcohol, 3, 3.5% alcohol, quite an interesting grist, um, probably quite a nice drink to have just when you're watching the television, man. I can't imagine they did much of that in the 1820s. <laughs> and so this is a, a little overview of the, of the sorts of strengths. This is, again, this is based a bit on guesswork, so you can't, you know, it's hard to, to, to really say if this is it's right or not. This is just going on the amount of malt and what, probably what sort of efficiency they were getting back then. Brown ale, it's, it's sort of like a lightly hot porter, really. Um, when I found out about its stitch, I was really interested in that. And it's one of the beers I would most like to get brewed. So it's the equivalent of a stout, except it's much more lightly hot. So 100% brown malt, uh, not very heavily hot, normally sold pretty young ones. Unless you can get diastatic brown malt, there's really not much point trying to brew that because you brew it any other way and it's not going to be the same beer. And that died out probably around 1800. And this is a sort of guess. So Stitch was probably about 1090, so a fairly decent strength. Burnt Ale, um, People often get confused about Burton Ale, and Burton was a style Burton Ale, especially in, in London, right up until the 1970s, where you could argue it still is, because Young's Winter Warmer is the last London Burton Ale. And so these have nothing to do with, uh, uh, with Burton Pale Ale. It's more like the original but <coughs> beers that made uh, Burton famous, which were strong, dark ales. And they always brewed these in Burton, and in fact, barley wine is a development of Burton Ale. So the original barley wine was Bass Number no. One, and that was their number one Burton Ale, so their strongest Burton Ale. And that was always about, had a gravity of about 1100 or so. Um, quite powerful beers. And Burton was already famous for its beer before Pale Ale, uh, something which people tend to have forgotten about nowadays. Uh, I mean, I quite like it. Burton Ale. It's another thing, I, a project I'd like to do is to get someone to brew a, 
true in the number one Burt Nile, which was where they, uh, so I've heard the brewer, the last person who made it, about what they did, which is they brew a high gravity brew beer up in Burton, age it for a year or two, then ship it down to London, brew a running version of the same beer, and then blend them up, trying to get the balance of the acidity of the beer. I mean, it sounds really interesting, but it hasn't been made commercially for probably 30 years. Um, pale and amber ale, basically, same thing as the beers, but just less heavily hot. Um, and it's, you have to remember that 18th century pale ale has absolutely nothing to do with modern pale ales. So a completely different drink. Not very heavily hot, and mostly served pretty young. Um, they eventually sort of became, so the, the, the pale ales of, of the 18th century, they became the mild ales of the early 19th century. So it's a bit confusing if you say, well, mild's actually a development of pale ale. It seems sort of like counterintuitive, but that's what it is really. Um, here's some examples. Again, pretty powerful gravities and fairly high final gravities, but still pretty decent strength. And that's me done. If you've, anyone's got any questions, I'll uh, try and dodge them so I can get some more beer. <laughs> Of, of aged 
stout from the 19th century is about 0.3% lactic acid, where lambic's about one and a half. So it's a big difference. Yes? One of your slides had about uh, 10 of the 18th century breweries on it. How yeah. many of those still exist? How many of those still exist? None. None. <laughs> um, the last one to close was Courage. Oh no, it doesn't even have Courage on. The last one to close would be uh, Truman, which closed in the late 1980s. Barclay Perkins closed in the 1950s. Whitbread closed in 1974. So, the last of them, none of them lasted longer than the 1980s. But they were the largest breweries in the world up until the 1850s. And you see, in the, in the early 19th century, they're producing even more beer there. I mean, Barclay Perkins were up to half a million barrels at one point. So, what happened? Um, consolidation. Consolidation, and, and, and when the brewery companies all merged, they moved out of London because it was too expensive, the land was worth too much money. Because most of them were fairly central. That's why most of the buildings completely disappeared. They have been redeveloped because the land was just worth too much money. Yes? So I'm trying to compare the the wood bags compared to the stainless steel that they use now. Have you ever had a beer which created one of those bags? Um, Is there much of a significant difference? Uh, I, I don't think I've ever had, ever have had a port of in in advance. All of that's got ripped out in London. All the big port of were taken out in the 1870s and 1880s when uh, the aged port went out of fashion, and they kept on aging stouts, but. They didn't need such big vats for that, so they had relatively small vats for that, but all the big ones were gone long before 1900. Alright, so I'm sure Ron will be happy to answer more questions. First of all, let's, let's thank him for a great time.